I'll call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's hearing of May 29th, 2024. We have a couple agenda items. We have a presentation um, from Vital on their budget, and then we also have um, two agenda items relating to One Care Vermont. Uh, first, I'll turn it to the Executive Director for Ms. Barrett's report. Great, thank you, Mr. Chair. We have several uh, public comment periods. I'll list through them quickly here, but please consult our website under public comments um, to uh, direct your public comments or learn more about these. So as you mentioned today, Chair Foster, we will hear from Vital on their annual budget, and we are accepting public comments in regard to this budget until um, noon on Tuesday, June 11th. We are also accepting public comments on the draft Vermont Global Payment Methods paper. On our uh, public comment page is a link to that draft, and we are accepting public comments until Tuesday, June 4th. Additionally, we're accepting public comments on the UVMMC Outpatient Surgery Center Certificate of Need application. And we will be accepting those comments until noon on Thursday, May 30th, tomorrow. I also wanted to provide an update on the work that the board is doing for Act 167 and the community engagement to support hospital transformation. We're currently completing the uh, phase two work and Dr. Bruce Hamry from Oliver Winan will be presenting the material to the communities over the next several months. We um, will have Dr. Hamry presenting to the board, the Green Mountain Care Board on June 19th, where he'll share some of his results. In addition, he'll be out in the Vermont communities in uh, July and uh, starting in July 10th. And we'll have all of those dates on our website. We'll, we will also have a, heavily publicize these dates so that the community members can come and listen to his recommendations. Um, we also have one on, ongoing public comment that I wanted to mention, and that is the AHEAD model. We've been hearing quite a bit um, here at the Green Mountain Care Board and um, working in collaboration with uh, the Agency of Human Services, who is leading the work on this um, model development. Um, we are accepting public comments. We appreciate those, and we are sharing all of those with our partners. And with that, I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, we have meeting minutes from May 22nd. Uh, I will move for approval of the meeting minutes. Second. Second. And all in favor, say aye. 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 The minutes are approved. Thank you. Um, next, we'll turn to our first agenda item, the vital presentation of its annual budget um, with Miss Beth Anderson, Kara Callanan, and Maureen Gilbert from Vital. Hello, I'll go. Away? ahead and share my screen. All right. Great. Um, so I'll just kick us off um, just to quick redo introductions. Um, so Beth Anderson, I'm the CEO at Vital. With me, you have Kara Kalanan, who is our CFO, Maureen Gilbert, who's our Director of Client Engagement. You're also going to hear from Christina Chilkat, who's our Director of Operations, and um, we also have Sue Fritz, our Director of IT, here in case we need her help answering any of your questions. Um, so we'll start with the budget presentation. I'll give you, we'll give a quick overview of um, our current year's performance and how things are going, and then Kara will take over and walk you through our proposed budget for 25. And then Maureen and Christina will walk you through our quarterly update materials and some of the metrics and the work that we've been doing. Um, so Maureen, if you don't mind going ahead to the first slide. We'll skip past contents and go right yeah, to- Sorry, I already, I already went that. through those. Accomplishments and projection. 
Thank you. Um, so, so the next slide. So just looking at um, the current fiscal year 2024, which you all know ends on June 30th. Um, just want to give you a sense of some of the work that we've done. You know, you approved our budget this time last year and want to tell you what we have accomplished. Um, so by the end of the year, we will have about 147 new interfaces developed to get data into the HIE. Um, we'll have 25 or at least 25 new results delivery interfaces, which are interfaces delivering results back out to providers into their EHRs, into their workflow. Um, we will have connected about 15 new organizations to have the query capability of through of the immunization registry. So you may recall traditionally providers have to log into the registry and look patient by patient um, for their immunization history. Now what we've been enabling in partnership with VDH is the ability for providers to, from within their EHR, query a patient's um, both um, immunization history, but also their forecast of what's needed. Um, we've gotten really great feedback about providers about having that at their fingertips, which has been really great um, and great working with VDH as always. Um, we've been working with the designated agencies, and those are the, the um, substance, mental health and substance use disorder agencies that, that handle part two programs to get their data in to VITAL. Um, our first steps with that work is really to bring the data in, serving as a QSO and delivering it to um, to AHS, to the Department of Mental Health, to do some of the reporting they're required to do. But now with the shift or the, the release of new part two rules at the federal level about how that data can be shared and, and which has kind of eased um, some of the burden with sharing that data, in the next year we'll be looking at how we might be able to think about sharing that data and the VHI appropriately. Uh, you'll hear a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, we have been working with VDH to collect and deliver reportable disease messages on behalf of hospitals. So we started this with COVID. You are probably familiar that there is a statute that requires a reporting on specific um, conditions and diseases when a, when a test confirms um, that an individual has one of those conditions. And uh, it's a very manual reporting process in some cases right now, and so we're working to automate that. So it's a benefit for VDH to get timely data, but also for the providers that are collecting this data to not have to follow some what are sometimes manual processes to get that data in. Um, we're continuing our work with Medicaid to get them data to support their operations. Um, we have done a lot of outreach and onboarding for Vital Access. It's our provider portal. Um, you can see, and Maureen will probably go into this in a little later, but we're seeing a significant increase in the number of active users and queries on that platform. So that's been really great responsiveness. We're happy about that. Um, We've been working with VDH um, to do, and you might recall last year, we did some analysis of the race, ethnicity, and language data that we have in the HIE to see how robust and how standardized it is. And so now um, in partnership with VDH, we're doing some outreach to providers where we found that they might not be um, fully coding to standards um, to see if we can work with them to improve their data quality, to have that data more robust in the HIE to help support some analytics and use cases. Um, Oh, we've delivered, or we actually are in the process of delivering our second public education campaign. Maureen Mar will talk more about that later, but we're excited to have gotten two of those in this year and getting really good feedback there. Um, and we are, as usual, uh, have been able to deliver the annual clinical data extract to the Blueprint for Health. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kara, who's going to walk through the financials for 24. Did you advance the slide one? Okay, here we go. Okay, so right now we are projecting our year end to come in um, at about $380,000 surplus, which is about $280,000 more than budgeted. And what we're seeing is that we have significantly less revenue because we have made decisions not to do certain DDI projects, either because either not to do them at all or to defer them into 2025. So that reduces our revenue and it reduces the uh, corresponding expenses, but you can see that expenses are projected to go down by 1.4, um, which is why we have that increased surplus. And, and a large part of that has to do with um, our salary expense, which is coming in at less than budgeted because it has taken longer for us to fill certain positions. The good news is that as we are approaching the end of this fiscal year, we have filled the majority of the positions that we had open and wanted to fill, and we feel really good about the people we have found and placed in those positions, but the time frame was just significantly longer, and that resulted in some additional savings. Um, but but again, we are 
projecting a slight increase in our surplus. Uh, next slide, please. And one more slide. Okay, our budget is, you know, as you'd expect, largely based off of the contract we are working through with the state, but it is also guided by the strategic plan for the VHI and the strategic plan for Vital as an organization. So again, as we made the funding decisions outside of the contract, these, these were our touchstones in making those decisions. One, one more slide, please. I'm sorry, so Karen, the there's contract, a little lag here. Oh, sorry. Um, the contract is um, is for a little over twelve million dollars, of which we have budgeted eleven about eleven point three million. And you can see on the slide the breakout between M and O and DDI, um, and that leaves just under nine hundred thousand dollars not budgeted. And those are projects that there are some reason we feel that we probably won't do them. Two hundred thousand of that is a task order, um, but that's that's really um, how we align with the contract. Next slide, please. So M and O is budgeted uh, um, to be higher this year than it was last year, and that is really for two reasons. Um, one is just uh, our cola increases as well as our contractual escalations, so essentially inflation. And then the other piece of it are new components or an increase in scope as we do DDI projects. Often that translates into additional scope under M and O and the subsequent years. And then the last piece is also that we have we now have a service level agreement um, where we are committing to 99.5% uptime uh, with penalties. So there's additional revenue to allow us to have after hours support and then also to cover penalties um, in the event that we have them. Next slide, please. Beth, do you want to kind of highlight the DDI projects? Yes, sorry. So um, as Karen mentioned, the, the contract, this is what we've discussed with um, with Agency for Human Services. This contract is now with CMS awaiting their approval. So what we're expecting to be in, approved in the contract um, are, are, are typical M&O and then these DDI projects. And so the DDI projects are, um, are continuations of some of the work we've been doing this year, as well as some new and exciting projects. So the first will be the application programming interfaces, and that's the project we had to defer from this year. Uh, but that is really using kind of the FIRE platform that we've put in place um, over the past couple of years to both um, integrate data in different ways, so to get data in, but also to make data available for providers and payers and others to access and be able to um, have more ways of getting the data and ways of getting the data and integrated it, integrating it into their systems in ways that they would like to do. So we're excited about that work. Um, we'll continue to build new interface both to get the data in, to get new, provi new providers as well as make sure we continue with existing providers, expanding the data that they're submitting and also doing results delivery um, connections to get the results out to providers. Um, we're going to continue our collaboration with public health, and this is work you've heard a lot about in the past couple of years. Um, we're really excited that, you know, it started with kind of a uh, fire drill of work around COVID has really built a strong relationship and, and um, partnership with the public health and ways that we have been continuing to explore how we can work together to make sure they're getting the data that they need. Um, that we are supporting providers' needs and easing some of their burden on how they do reporting and get access to data, and also making sure we're not um, we're not investing in duplicative platforms and work, right? And really it, focus on where we all are have our our value. Um, so some of the work we'll be doing this year is continuing to do to build the connections to the labs within hospitals to do that electronic lab reporting, which I mentioned a few moments ago, um, so to kind of ease the burden of having to do the manual reporting for reportable diseases and conditions. Um, we're going to continue doing the, the um, connections to the immunization registry, so that query capability, again, from within the EHR to avoid logging into different systems. Um, we're going to, and this project we're pretty excited about is work with the WIC, the Women, Infants, and Children's Program, to get them data about participants in the program, which is going to both help the program um, from an administrative perspective, but really also help the families that benefit or could benefit from that program, because right now they have pretty regular reporting requirements of like showing up um, and answering questions, bringing medical information, and allowing, uh, we're going to be doing some reporting for the staff, and this is based on a um, 
a pilot that happened in, I think it's Iowa, Maureen will correct me if I'm wrong, um, um, that they did with their WIC program. And it's really been a great way for them to both keep, uh, make it much easier for families to participate, stay in the program, but also to get access to the program and taking the burden away from them having to show up in person and, and do those appointments. Um, we're also going to do two projects, um, pilot projects um, around getting some of the VDH data into the HIE. So you may recall um, one of the projects we had this year was um, working with VDH. They had a, an, a, an assessment done to do a strategic plan for how we better integrate VDH and the VHI um, and some of our capabilities and consult worked to understand kind of needs and priorities and kind of bandwidth of the both the VDH and the, the vital teams. And we have a prioritized list of projects we'd like to tackle that will take us many years to get through. Uh, but we're going to do the first two of those this year. And that's integrating data from the immunization registry back into the HIE. So will we deliver a lot of the data to them? We don't have all of it. Um, so this will make sure we have a more complete and accurate record in the VHI for access. Um, and we're also going to integrate birth registry data, which we don't have. We've been at, we've been integrating the death registry data, but having this birth registry data will also be really helpful for providers in delivering care. Um, we are going to continue um, enhancing access to the rider portal. So that's not just onboardings and outreach. Reach, but what that act also means is we're going to be looking at ways of making it easier to get into the provider portal. So working with organizations to expand what's called single sign-on capability. So instead of having to log in with a second set of credentials, a provider in their AHR will be able to just kind of go directly to the provider portal without logging in, just saving some burden and having to remember another password. Um, also looking at uh, some security enhancements around it as well. Um, we're going to continue working with AHS to support both the Medicaid data warehouse project they have going on to support Medicaid operations and analytics, and also the unified health data space and thinking about where um, what um, what kind of analytics and reporting we can provide to the healthcare community as a whole, not specific to Medicaid, but overall. We're excited about some of that work. Um, we're going to embark on a project to more formally collect social determinants of health data into the HIE and while we do get this data in some cases, and we've also been working with AHS to get some of their data in to the VHI, we, there's a statewide group working together to um, really coalesce around co what collection of this data looks like. And um, they've agreed to use a CMS standard. So it's a set, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services has a, what's called the AHS HRS, and I'm going to try to get this right. It's the Accountable Health Communities Health Related Social Needs Questionnaire. And so it's a questionnaire that's kind of standardized by CMS for providers to use to collect the data. And we're going to be looking to set, um, define some real clear um, standards for how this data should be collected and submitted to the HIE. So it really is um, comparable and shareable across organizations. And we're excited about that. Um, we're going to continue supporting the state's MDAT program. That's a Medicaid data access and aggregation program. Um, and that, sorry, I program on there twice. Um, that program was really focused on supporting providers who might not have been uh, eligible or ready to take part in the federal meaningful use program that expired a few years ago. Um, but to, to help those help providers in the state to um, explore implementing certified health information technology so they can have actually robust EHRs in their practices, also to help them connect to the HIE and kind of work their workflows around the new technologies. And the real focus on some of that program is more on behavioral health, long-term care, and providers who, again, might not have been ready for those programs earlier. And so we'll be working with the state and those providers to get them onboarded to the HIE. Um, then finally, this last piece we're excited about is um, some new funding available for a two-year program to do some provider outreach. And so what that's really going to look like is um, probably a couple of different pieces of work. So some of that is really making sure that we're getting out in front of all providers so they understand what's available for them in the HIE and how they can use the data and how they can access it and how they might think about working it into their workflows but also doing some more education and learning for providers around some um, topics to be determined, but things might be like TEFCA and national data exchange or new rules around reproductive data, things like that, and making sure the healthcare community is understanding what's happening and has some resources about what's happening kind of in the larger healthcare ecosystem. And so with that, Carol, I'll pass it back to you. Great, thank you. Okay, so this may be hard to read, but this is our 
our budget for the um, upcoming fiscal year. And I'm just going to pull up my screen so I can read it a little bit better. So we are budgeting to a surplus of about $140,000. Um, again, we've talked about the revenue is largely um, coming from our contract, um, but it totals about $12 million across all, all lines. We are showing an increase in budgeted um, payroll, that is both COLAs and also the creation of um, some additional, three additional positions that we will be filling specifically to address some of the DDI projects. One of those positions will be limited to a limited two-year position. And then you'll also see the one other area with a significant increase is outside support. And again, that is that increase um, corresponds to the increase in DDI projects that we expect to be doing. And that type of work is uh, specialized short-term consulting. And that is kind of an overview of that. Um, next slide, please. Next. Next slide, please. Sorry, is it still not up? It should say FY25 revenue. Is that the one? Yeah, the over? next one. Yep. Yeah, and this one will be just for a moment. It's not a, a big slide. We'll probably go through the next slides pretty quickly. Is it not advancing? It's not. A, no, it's not advancing. Okay, you know what? I might um, be... Let me switch to a different. Um, nope, you just if that's fine. You've advanced this a little faster than, but that's fine. Just you can <laughs> hold here. There was okay. a slide that you probably have in your pack, and it just sort of outlines the different types of revenue. Um, the majority of that revenue is coming from MO, followed by DDI. Um, there's some deferred revenue as well as some revenue from alternative sources that's much smaller. And this slide here is just giving you a visual representation of um, software expense and how it breaks down into you know, our um, V high licensing, as well as like our business use and our DDI enhancements. And then the same thing on the other side, we have outside support and it kind of shows you a split between what we consider to be operational m and and running the business versus DDI. So as you can see, the outside support is, is a big, the majority of that is specific to DDI. So um, that's why when you look at Fiscal 24, and I, we show that we didn't do some of the DDI projects that reduced revenue, it also reduced expense. It's largely in this outside support area where they kind of move together. Um, next slide, please. All right. And again, this is just a visual representation of what makes up um, our, our compensation or our personnel expense. And you can see that the majority of it is gross salaries, and then there's other, other um, fringe benefits and, and payroll taxes and that sort of thing. Next slide, please. Uh, this is our, our cost structure. And one thing to note on here is the decrease in our um, indirect rate. And that's really driven by two things. And one is that um, as we've added staff or we add other expenses, we are largely adding them almost exclusively as program costs, people who work on the VHI rather than in our overhead departments. And overhead departments are largely accounting, human resources, and executive. And, and that's sort of been kind of flat. We've also cleaned up some accounting where we had um, the use of, a, of, of general administrative as kind of a place where people put um, time that didn't fit easily into certain projects. And what we're working on is having people who work on the on the program just do a better job of tracking their time and allocating it to the program rather than just kind of parking it in GNA. So that's kind of the two reasons you see that drop. Um, next slide. Um, and this is just, again, a visual of where we are and where we think we're headed in terms of the assets on our balance sheet. And the next slide. And then, Beth, this is just a discussion on Rhapsody and yeah, so just, archive. Yep, yeah, thank you. Just wanted to give a quick update. You might recall in the last two budgets at the end of, or when we presented our last two budgets at the at the end of each fiscal year, we um, we asked for approval to set aside some of our surplus to support um, projects like infrastructure projects that would have value to the HIE. And the two projects are really a Rhapsody integration engine redesign. 
and then um, creation of a new message archive um, capability for us. And so just wanted to give you a little bit of an update on those projects. Um, teams internally have been really working hard on developing kind of design for what those look like, um, really making sure we had our requirements and use cases clear um, and started doing some of the planning work those projects, which um, they are now in the process of really digging in to start um, start the development of those projects. You might have noticed earlier some of the work with where we are now is setting up the um, infrastructure, the cloud infrastructure to really support those projects. So you'll hear more about that from us over the next year as we do some of the real implementation and deep work on those projects. I think with that, we complete the budget piece. I'm happy to answer questions now or pass it to Maureen for the quarterly update and get through all of it. Up to you. Why don't we do the quarterly update and save questions? Great. All right. All right. So we're just going to highlight a few recent projects here um, in the quarterly update. And um, as you saw from Beth, the long list of accomplishments in FY24 and projects upcoming in FY25, we couldn't possibly talk about all of them in each quarterly update. But I want to hit on ones where there's this common theme um, of the way we provide value to our healthcare community. And really, this is all about finding efficiencies and reducing burden for healthcare providers and the organizations that they work at. Um, so each of these pro projects are about making data sharing or data access more efficient for the providers and for their organizations. And the core way that we do this is providing by providing a hub for data sharing, where building a single connection to vital delivers uh, healthcare organizations data on to many destinations, including places um, where they're required to provide data or places where that data is going to be useful to other providers and their patients. And Christina is going to talk about one of these examples, and this is the immunization registry query and response service. Thanks, Maureen. I'm happy to talk about this. So as uh, Beth had mentioned earlier, uh, VITAL has partnered with the Department of Health to focus on public health, and we launched and rolled out that immunization registry query and response in, in 2023. And we've worked with them to not only implement the capability to query and retrieve within the provider EHRs or histories, but also to get the immunization forecasts. And so wanted to give a little bit of flavor around this. You might hear this called bi-directional because of the query and response connection that we've done um, with 13 organizations so far. And it's a hot commodity. So we have 13 more organizations in the hopper that we will continue to onboard uh, through the next year. And I think this number really shows the value and the interest in getting this data. There were over 50,000 queries uh, by the uh, clinicians to uh, access this information from the Vermont Department of Health Immunization Registry between January and the end of April, 2024. Next slide, please. So Beth also had highlighted the electronic lab reporting connections that we've made and uh, under the reportable and communicable diseases rule, laboratory tests that are specific diseases and conditions must be reported to the Vermont Department of Health. And again, it's a manual process. And so the Vermont Department of Health partnered with us to be able to set up connections to reduce that burden and not set up a separate connection to the Department of Health, but to already um, use the, the relationships that we have with these organizations to expand upon the laboratory reporting. Uh, again, we have set up interfaces to collect uh, the COVID test results. So we're doing, we're using that good work in order to expand to other lab uh, uh, reportable diseases. And we are piloting with two hospitals. We have more connections that are planned, uh, uh, prioritizing with the Department of Health, of which uh, hospitals those would be in our next year's contract. And just to give you again a flavor, there are, are over 75 reportable laboratory findings. So you can imagine the manual work that would be uh, uh, in place in order to report those 75 findings. And 
the good news is once we have that data, not only do we share it with the Department of Health, we can also have that data be available in vital access. And I'll pass Thanks, it Christina. back to Maureen. Sure. All right. So um, next up is single sign-on to vital access, and Beth talked about this briefly earlier. Um, vital access being that essential tool, the clinical portal where you can go in um, if you are an author authorized provider or member of healthcare organization staff and look up a patient record, sort of one patient at a time. And we've seen great growth in vital access over the past year, so 44% growth in queries so far in fiscal year 24. Um, we also know that there's more potential here and that one of the big barriers to use of this service is that separate login um, and moving out of the system, the EHR that you as a provider are working in day to day um, into another uh, system. So we believe that single sign on is going to um, help um, you know, get rid of that barrier and, and further boost growth. Uh, the way it's going to work is there will be a button in providers EHRs that they can go in um, and they can click and they can launch into a patient chart in vital access directly from that same patient's chart in the provider's EHR. So not only do they not have to um, enter separate credentials, they don't have to perform another search. And we know that every minute counts in a provider's day, so this could be a real um, uh, win for, for them. Uh, we are currently identifying a new contractor to help develop this, and we are surveying healthcare organizations to confirm their interest and readiness with the expectation that we'll be building these new single sign-on connections in early FY25. Um, next up, and this is kind of moving away from this conversation we were just having about projects that we've been working on and into a conversation about policy. Um, we do want to share that there is uh, an update to our secondary use policy, which is the policy that governs access by health care plans and accountable care organizations. We sort of colloquially call it our secondary use policy. Um, this updated policy expands how they can use Vermont Health Information Exchange data specifically to allow um, additional health care operations, quality assessment and improvement activities. Um, which include outcomes evaluation and development of clinical guidelines, not at this point research, um, patient safety activities, population based activities relating to improving health or reducing health care costs, protocol development, and also case management and uh, care coordination. And we invited comment on the proposed policy change from participating healthcare organizations and others through um, email and announcement on our website and social. Um, and we are going to be using the same approach to notify organizations of the updated policy and just want to thank um, all the organizations that did provide feedback here. So next up, patient education update. Um, we are currently in the midst of our second um, patient education campaign of fiscal year 24. Um, you, if you listen to commercial radio, most likely have um, been inundated in the last uh, week or so with these radio messages. We are really making a big effort to, to have the kind of volume that makes an impact in awareness and people's understanding of um, how their health data is being shared um, and why it matters and the options available to them. Uh, there's also been a front porch forum message that uh, started yesterday. There's social media happening, um, and there will be a Vermont Digger sponsored news story just to give an opportunity to tell kind of a longer form story with a little more detail. We also continue to encourage provider organizations to educate Vermonters um, and support them with an education toolkit. Now I'm going to go into our quarterly metrics, the um, results that we report to you each time we're here. Um, First one being the opt out rate, and I do apologize if I'm talking about things before the slides catch up to me. Um, do my best to keep them synced here. Um, so our opt out rate is now at 1.05 percent, um, and uh, we do continue to get calls and inquiries from folks asking to be opted out or sometimes asking to be opted back in. We get both. Um, and the rate is uh, 
decreasing over time as new uh, individuals uh, are added to the health information exchange. Our vital access queries per month, right now we're up to 17,840 um, patient searches, and again, a 44% increase since the beginning of the fiscal. Uh, I imagine that one of the questions you may have is, so where's that increase coming from? Um, what we see is that it's really across the board that we're seeing growth um, in almost every category of user. Um, and you'll see here the, the query is broken up by organization type and you see good coverage with um, independent practices, with uh, designated agencies, emergency medical services using this a lot. Federal and state agency that access is primarily, but not exclusively, the Vermont Department of Health. Um, hospitals in the mix for sure, federally qualified health centers, just really good distribution here of use. Um, we do also report on queries of the health information exchange via eHealth Exchange. Um, this is not happening right at the moment, but connections are being reestablished um, through a hub model to uh, the University of Vermont Health Network and also to the VA DOD um, healthcare system so that they can pull documents out of the Vermont Health Information Exchange directly into their own records. Results delivery is the service whereby we deliver laboratory results, radiology reports, and transcribed reports to providers who are, are named in that um, uh, lab order or radiology um, imaging study order, we deliver those results back into the provider EHRs. This is one of those cases where we're actually getting the data right into the organization's EHR so they can use it in their main tool. Um, and we are seeing a little bit of, of growth here. Um, we do connect to 600 providers. 600 providers receive these results in their EHRs. Last time we were here, there was a question about how many organizations received these results and how many EHRs. It's 34 organizations that receive results. They get those results from 13 organizations. And you'll see on the next slide, it's primarily um, independent practices and federally qualified health centers getting results um, from hospital labs and hospital imaging. Um, and the question about how many EHRs, it's 13 different EHRs um, covering 34 organizations. So here's that, that slide showing you who is receiving the results, the federally qualified health centers and independent practices. And that is everything that we've got. So I will, I'll turn it over for questions now. Great, thank you. Um, I'll open up to the board for any questions or comments. I can start. Um, I just want actually two questions, but they're quite related. Um, you mentioned uh, there was additional funding for provider outreach. Um, I think I heard you say. Um, and but I noticed in the budget, it looked like education and outreach was falling between 24 and 25. It looked like there was less money available for that. So I was that was one question. And then related to that um, was, will that funding support or how recently have you done it? Forgive me if my memory is failing here, but I'm just wondering about a clinician survey, you know, the boots on the ground folks that are using vital access, like how um, will that funding support you know, a survey to see how they are valuing vital access, how they're using it, when they're using it, um, what data and services do they wish it provided, and then what's the gap in knowledge between what you actually do provide and what they need, and maybe some of it's there, they're just not aware of it. I'm just wondering if there's a, uh, a plan, or if you've recently done it, or if there's a plan to do that type of surger, su survey, and then um, also just was wondering about the budget since it looked like yeah. it's less, so. Yeah, I'll start, Maureen, but you may want to comment as well. So no, um, as far as the budget, that's a much straightforward answer. That that um, spending is actually a staff member, so that would be under staffing and not the education line. And Kara is going to correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's right. Okay, good. So, so the money's in there. It's just in a different line. And yeah, sorry, that wasn't clear. Um, and then as far as um, 
feedback. You know, I don't know that we have plans for a, a dedicated survey. I think Maureen's team does a really good job when they're doing hands-on work with our clients about talking to them about what they need, what's working, what doesn't work, and getting that feedback and using that feedback to inform our work going forward. Um, it could be interesting, particularly now that we have, you know, a real good mass of users um, to try to get that feedback. But I do think um, as we do this outreach, a Survey might be hard because where we struggle, so struggle is not the right word, but where we find sometimes is um, oftentimes providers don't know they're using our data, um, even though it's in in their systems because results are going directly in and they doesn't say it's coming from vital, it's just in there. And so um, sometimes it makes it, you know, asking them about their experience with our data or our work sometimes, I mean, it's good for identifying the gaps for sure, but, but it does make it harder to answer that. Um, Maureen, do you have? Not to put you on the spot, but I don't want to answer for you. No, um, I don't have a ton to add here other than I do think having this new staff member in the mix will really kind of open up the possibilities for um, the feedback loops with providers. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. I have. Hi everyone, it's Robin. Um, I had a question on um, the secondary use policy. Could you maybe pull that slide back up? You went through it very quickly, so <laughs> I just wanted to absolutely talk a yes bit more about it. I apologize if I don't recall this from the materials. I think it was okay. slide. We should five. be on that slide right now. And um, oh, you apologize are. if it lags. Nope, you're good. You're good. Um, could you talk a little bit about more about the substance of the policy? So the idea here is to limit this the how providers or others who get the information would then use it for other purposes. Is that a good summary. Maureen, do you want me to take this one or do you? Sure, please. Yeah. So so we've had a policy on secondary use for many, many, it well predates me, but for many years. And it's really, it's specific to health plans and the accountable care organization. It's not for providers. Providers have full access and use of the data for treatment payment operations, like the more traditional HIPAA guidelines. Um, and, and the secondary use policy has been in place um, really to think about how payers or um, an ACO might use the data uh, in different ways. And it might be more traditional HIPAA, TPO, um, it, under operations specifically, might allow them to use it, allows health data to be used sometimes for provider evaluation or pricing. And, you know, the concern and what this policy was trying to address is a good balance of like supporting health plans and the ACO in their needs for like care coordination and really improving service and, and pricing, but also wanting to make sure that we had a balance of like not having providers feel like data that they are actively and, you know, volunteering to provide to the HIE be used in ways that they might feel is negative for them. So it's really trying to find a balance. Um, specifically why we've, we've tried to expand um, the definition here so so traditionally they haven't been able to use it for treatment and payment except for post post payment audits um that access under uh, healthcare operations was really limited to care coordination um and what we're what what this expansion really does is really kind of helps to meet some of the needs we've heard from the acos and the health plans about what they want to use the data for to support their operations and some of it's around doing more um, community-based care and care coordination and how the data might be accessed for those purposes. Um, and also for um, helping with kind of follow-up with patients. And, you know, really, it really is it kind of expanding some of their capabilities around the care coordination and who might be part of that discussion. That, okay, helped. thank you. Great. Yeah, Thanks. yep, yep, that, that helped. I had a vague recollection of the secondary use policy, but I haven't looked at it for a while. So that having a little more information was helpful. Um, and then on slide 11, and I don't think you need to necessarily go to this slide, you mentioned that part of what your work uh, with a through the AHS con contract is supporting um, the unified health 
data space. And I wonder if you could just expand on like, what exactly does that mean? Yeah, that's what a great question. And yeah. Um, and so the unified health data space is, um, you may recall from the, um, the HA strategic plan that you reviewed, um, is this goal of having this space um, that really enables different access to the data in the HIE, expands the types of data, and then makes it available for more for kind of analytics and reporting purposes. And um, and that the, what that looks like may be very different for different types of providers. So kind of one of the first steps that's going to happen um, is really um, with at AHS's lead is getting input from the healthcare community across the state about what they want and what they would want out of this and, and what their current capabilities are, right? Because I think we're, we think that the space also, for some of, I'm gonna, I'm completely making generalizations and assumptions and I realize I will be totally off, but some of the bigger hospitals probably have tools to do the analytics, but may want the data to inform that. A smaller practice might not have the tool to do the analytics and may need some help and even the, the tools to do some of the work. And so really trying to understand where everyone's at and what their needs are. And like, I, I don't, you know, the, this is going to be a multi-year project. Of, you know, we're going to figure out the needs can then define a roadmap for how to start to meet them and prioritize those. Um, so that first step is really the requirements gathering. And we will be an active part of that work with AHS this year. Thank you. That's all I had. Excuse me. This seems like a good place to jump in because I just wanted to um, let you know how much I appreciated the secondary use policy. I think that that's, um, I think it's a big deal. And I think, um, you know, one of, one of the things that would be helpful to a lot of hospitals, to a lot of, ACOs are to answer questions about the prevalence um, and care coordination for patients with ambulatory care sensitive conditions. And the example that I've used the last two years when we've met is being able to answer a question such as what proportion of my patients have diabetes and of those with diabetes, what proportion have an A1C level greater than nine and of those who hasn't been seen in the last six months. And of those that haven't been seen in the last six months, how many end up in the ED and how many end up admitted? Um, because those are the populations that research has shown us over and over again, where we can make substantial improvements and we can better, those improvements would save a lot of money. Most organizations that um, in my consulting work and regulatory work and working with the Joint Commission, um, most organizations cannot answer those questions. And meanwhile, many of those same organizations are, are, are um, investing in artificial intelligence or big data, other types of catchy, fancy things, but they can't answer basic questions that only require division, no real analysis. So um, I like um, hearing what you, uh, presented today. It seems like it's a good path. And I just hope that um, you can keep doing it and faster. Great. Um, I, I might add, I know you didn't have a question, but if you don't mind, I'm going to kind of respond because I'm excited about oh, what please. we're doing too. But some other work that we have going on here that I didn't really touch on is um, we're also, you know, we have the team doing some work within our data to understand that we can answer those questions or see where we might need to work with providers to get more data to be able to, to be sure that we can, you know, once we start being able to use the data in this way that we can yeah. answer the questions or or where we might have gaps and want to address them. Yeah, that's super, Beth, because it's those, everything needed to answer those questions is available, but they live in Should different be. places, right? Yes. And it, it's the, the trick, um, it isn't to develop a big regression model, it's just division, but it's how do you get the numbers in one place to do the division? And that's that's this that's the struggle, but it's not sexy enough. <laughs> People don't don't think that that requires all the attention that it really does. And yeah. so I just I appreciate the work that you're trying to do, and I think that that um, that was the the slide that jumped out at me during your presentation. That oh, that will unlock a lot of um, 
if if that's a new development in the last year, your ability to do what I've been commenting on was, um, you know, your hands were a little tied, and and this change kind of allows that to, you know, take some of that away and allows you to go forward. So, yeah. um, I'm really I'm excited about what you shared. Great, we are too. Thank you. Yeah. I just have uh, one quick question and comment or two, but um, on the slide where you showed the, um, not I, I believe the queries are actually the documents received from lab results, uh, imaging results, and transcribed reports there. It looked like there was a substantial bump in January 2024. It sort of been sitting in the 90,000s and then it kind of went to up 10 or 15, 10 or 12,000. Is there, I was just curious if there was something that occurred at the end of the year. It looked like a lot of it was in transcribed reports to me, just from the visual. Um, I was just curious if there was something that, that changed. Was it easier for people to get the data, or is this now counting reports that are being delivered through different EHRs? Or We have been building and replacing some. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say we've been building and replacing new connections. I think we had a pretty steady um, group of providers receiving results for a while, pretty steady group of organizations, but we've been um, building some new connections and replacing some ones that had been down for a few years um, just in the last several months. So um, that's how I would explain that recent growth. Christina, would you add anything? Yeah, that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, and I guess my my comment is um, just I'm I'm encouraged by the uh, the the um, transition to more of the single uh, single sign on uh, use through the EHR. I mean, as a provider, you know, it's it's time, but it's also distraction and different workflows and di different cognitive buckets, and so it's challenging to 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 be distracted and to use those different cognitive buckets when you're trying to get through, you know, the, the workflow of your day. So I, I, I'm, I'm really encouraged by that. And, and also the, the increased interface that you're having with various EHRs, to me, this all ties into, you know, the, the greater uh, health reform act 167 work, transformation work, what, what, what not within the state where organizations can easily access information from other organizations and the care of patients. So I, I it, it seems exciting and encouraging the continued work in that direction. I guess I, I may say my 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 dream is a little less analytical with what you do and more being able to just access data from different places and and uh, eliminate the need that everybody be on the same EHR platform and this be that that neutral in between. So I'm I'm, mm -hmm. I'm excited and thank you. Good, thank you. Great. Um, I'll turn to the healthcare advocate for any comments or questions they may have. Sure. Just, you know, two comments and I guess a question. Um, you know, it's, I, I don't, I think Vital's work of, you know, connecting an exceedingly fractured system is, we should not underestimate the complexity inherent in that and the achievements of, you know, developing APIs to link you know, 13 EHRs, that's no small feat. Um, I think I share um, board member Merman's excitement about the single sign-on. I think that's a fascinating um, occurrence and will benefit folks. I guess this question is for Beth. I was wondering about the, you know, for from FY24 projection to FY25 budget, it's a roughly, 20% increase in revenue. Um, so, right, like, and, and what's driving that and how much of that is at this moment relatively certain? It's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, it is a significant increase. It is more work than we've been doing um, traditionally. Um, and, you know, some of the increase was in the M&O, the maintenance and operations, and just general kind of escalators, right? And that's just costs that go up. Um, some of that is new work we're doing because we built some new capabilities this in this current year that need to be supported. 
um, you know, the rest of it is more project work. Um, but, you know, you also saw that the budget does include additional staffing and consultants to support that work. So, um, you know, I think the biggest pieces, like if you look, the API project is a pretty significant project, um, and that's going to take a significant amount of operational and technical resources. We're excited about that project. We think it's really great, but that is going to um, be some new capabilities for us. Um, I think, you know, the work with with Medicaid too, um, both in support of the Medicaid operations and the Unified Health Data Space, there's um, some work there. And, and that's some, you know, some we're still defining with them. And that's one of the projects that's maybe a little unclear that Kara mentioned. But some of that work is actually so the Medicaid and the AHS can start using some of our tools to support some of their work, the patient index being a good example of that work, right? So, you know, the we did that collaborative services project so many years ago to think about how do we have one platform that serves um, community healthcare needs, right? And this is another step towards doing that work and expanding those capabilities. And so I think those are some of the bigger projects in public health. Like there's a, you heard, you heard me, you heard Christina talk. There's a lot of public health work, which we think is like, we just remain excited about that work with them because it really is just so impactful across the community, right? Both for public health and the providers. Um, and I think, you know, that work is work we've been doing. It's just doing more of, so we know, we know what we're in for. And I feel confident about those pieces of the work. <laughs> Thank you. That's it. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and any public comment via raise the hand? I, I see none. Um, well, thank you all very much for coming in. It was nice to see everyone again. And thank you for the very um, pre in, impressive presentation. Um, I like the formats are kind of consistent because it helps me follow along easier than I did the first time. So thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, with that, thank you. Have a good day. We Thanks, have a bye. staff presentation, staff presentation and potential vote um, relating to one cares fiscal year 25 budget. And I'll turn to Michelle Sawyer and Mark Hengstler for the presentation on that. Wonderful. Thank you, Chair Foster. So we are here today for a potential vote on One Care Vermont's um, FY25 budget guidance. Let me just adjust my screen a bit here. All right. So um, just wanted to note that um, we, at, to this point, have not received any public comment on these documents, um, though we did in the past week receive some communication from One Care um, regarding both their stance on this budget guidance, um, namely on the administrative budget by function appendix, although they did um, give us some other small feedback. Um, and they also provided feedback on the next agenda item for today's board meeting, uh, which is the FY24 budget order amendment issue. So from last week, when I presented the draft budget guidance to the board, um, I really heard that there are three things that we wanted to make some changes to. The first was some um, language changes to the introduction section and um, some language in one of the budget targets. Um, the second was an appendix around uh, One Care's administrative budget by function or program. And the third um, was really around um, a, the language and how the revised budget is described in the guidance. So we'll start with the introduction. Um, not the best slide with lots of words, but I'm just going to read through. You can see the changes are in bold, and I did keep the um, any words that were moved is struck through just so it's very clear. So this is how it's currently drafted. Um, recognizing that business year 2025 is the final year of this ACO payment model, the GMCB is focusing the budget guidance on ensuring appropriate final year ACO administrative expenses that reflect the value to Vermonters and Vermont community providers of the ACO, ensuring sufficient oversight of the ACO and reporting data and information that will assist in future efforts while reducing reporting that will no longer be useful. 
As such, the approach to this guidance is to suggest the ACO minimize administrative expenses to support only programs shown to yield positive benefits in terms of access, quality, and affordability for Vermonters and positive benefits for Vermont community providers and finish out this model while freeing up resources to be deployed for future purposes. So in summary, we opened up the language a little bit, highlighting that um, we wanted to see value for not just Vermonters, but for community providers, and not just financial benefits, but benefits in terms of access quality and affordability. And um, we also edited uh, budget target number three to reflect um, that introductory language. So I'll just read you the previous version. Um, the ACO's administrative budget should not include expenses associated with programs not demonstrated to yield positive financial results for Vermonters. It should only include programs necessary and resources necessary for it to satisfy all payer model requirements. Um, we opened this, we brought in this budget target a little bit as well because um, we became aware that um, there are several new waivers coming down the pipeline and we didn't want to discourage OneCare's um, investment and, and implementation of those new waivers. Um, so we included language to say that is that, you know, that's fine. Um, so let me just read through the current draft. With the exception of implementation of new waivers provided in the first amended and restated Vermont All Payer ACO Model Agreement 2024 Amendment Number One, the ACO's administrative budget should not support new programs in FY 2025 in order to ensure final year expenses are appropriate to winding down the payment model. Administrative expenses should be targeted to those expenses associated with one, programs demonstrated to yield positive benefits in terms of access quality and or affordability for Vermonters and benefits for Vermont community providers, or two, programs and resources necessary for it to support all payer model requirements, or three, meet payer contractual ob ob uh, excuse me, obligations and or participation requirements. So that's the language change. Um, and then we also did have to, or, or we decided to make um, a, a fairly small edit to an appendix. Um, this is a long standing appendix that has been in the guidance um, for many years that OneCare, when they submit to us, provides us a very informative uh, matrix of all of their population health and payment and reform programs and really how those all function. So if we wanted to, uh, one care to focus on how their programs uh, enhance uh, affordability, quality and access, we really wanted to um, give them the opportunity to describe to the board how each one of their programs addresses these um, certain areas. So we added three columns into this um, particular appendices just again to um, give one care a very um, clear space to describe how these these programs work. All right, the second uh, change that we we wanted to address uh, was the appendix 6.10, the administrative budget by function. And over on the left, you can see a screenshot of um, the drafted version from last week um, where we broke out um, uh, all of the functions or programs that one care might undertake um, and we're asking them to uh, provide data um, their 2024 actuals once if they were to start tracking it um, and then also what they would expect for 2025. Um, we did uh, have a discussion with one care during the um, meeting last week and then following that and and we worked with them to try to find um, a draft of of this appendices that would meet the needs of the board and perhaps lessen the administrative burden by aligning it to better to how their uh, business functions. Um, so the way that it is currently broken out, you can see the top section it's labeled as salaries. And I want you to think of those as like a variable cost that could be associated with all of those um, different smaller categories there. 
And then underneath that, it says non-salary operating expenses. Those are, um, as described by One Care, really fixed costs. So regardless of attribution, regardless of the number of programs run by One Care, they're saying that those particular line items, the amount of um, shift in the amounts there would really are, are very minimal, um, if any at all. So this particular draft would ask One Care to describe those um, fixed costs just for doing business that they have to have in place. And then above is really where we get to the variable costs, um, which are essentially salaries at this point. Um, so this is a, definitely a shift from um, how we were thinking about this before. Um, and so I just wanted to bring this before the board and see if this um, continues to meet the needs of the board. And then lastly, the third change, um, as we discussed last uh, last week, the revised budget process was simply described in the budget guidance document, um, uh, giving one care an idea of what um, this has always looked like and what it would look like in the following uh, year. However, given um, the recent experience with the revised budget and the fact that um, you know, there's a lot of a lot in flux right now with with um, health care reform in Vermont and models. Um, we decided to remove the language altogether and the board can determine either in December or early next year how to or if to do a revised budget process. Um, but for now, we're just removing this from the the guidance document. And those are all of the changes. So I'd like to hand it back to you, Chair Foster, for any board discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much for the update on the guidance. Um, any board member thoughts or discussion points on the presentation? I can jump in real quick. Hearing. Um, it, Michelle, would you put back up the slide um, with the uh, budget by function? I, I, I'm I'm okay with this uh, organization. I just don't know if I would refer to the non-salary operating expenses as fixed. Um, public and participant communications, I would think would vary by the size and scope of the programs and a few other things as well. But uh, I, but, but that said, I think non-salary operating expenses may be the appropriate definition for that group. That's all. I'll just I don't have much to say. say. Go ahead, Go ahead Robin. <laughs> Uh, I'm comfortable with the changes. Thanks. Yeah, I, I was just going to say the same thing. Thank you so much to Michelle and team. You know, I think that this has been a uh, an evolution, but I am comfortable with where we all landed and uh, appreciate this, the staff's work on this. It's time for me. Thank you, Michelle and staff. Um, I'll turn it to the healthcare advocate. Good afternoon. Um, nothing from us. Thanks, Michelle, uh, for all the work on this. This makes sense to us. Appreciate it. And I'll open it up to public comment. Mr. Boris. Good afternoon, everybody. Tom Boris, CFO for One Care of Vermont. Just want to uh, echo the comments of the board and appreciation for uh, Michelle and Mark. I've uh, had some good discussions, and I think we landed in a good space. Um, and Dr. Merman, I agree with you in, in concept that those costs aren't necessarily always fixed, but we're operating under a working assumption that our program designs will look similar in size, size and scope in 2025, meaning that there's no 
you know, big changes that would cause kind of a plateau effect in those operating expenses. So technically, I agree with you, but I do expect that they'll look very similar and can generally be considered fixed costs next year. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Sawyer, do you have a um, draft motion? Sure. Pretty simple there. Does that work for you? It does work. Um, I move to approve the One Care Vermont Fiscal Year 25 budget guidance presented today by Green Mountain Care Board staff. Um, and Second. we have no changes to discuss today. Okay, thank you, Jess. Um, any other board member comment or discussion relating to the motion? Any other public comment? All in favor of approving the motion, say aye. 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 And the motion carries. And thank you, Michelle, and one care for working on this and um, coming to what I think is a very good place. And uh, we look forward to one cares participation in 2025. And um, thanks for being here on this presentation today. Um, the next agenda item is the, um, uh, the draft uh, amendment to one cares budget order, the fiscal year 24 budget order. Hey, good afternoon. Um, I will, I don't have new slides for the board today, but I'm going to pull up my um, draft language from last week and uh, just touch on one or two quick items. Um, so just a reminder, um, there we go. Just a reminder, we're talking about two potential amendments to the FY24 budget order for one care. The first concerns um, popula population health payments uh, made to hospitals. Second concerns the um, administrative budget by function that uh, is incorporated in the guidance that the board just approved for FY25. Um, we received some, uh, I'll, I'll start with the first item. We received comment from one care um, when I initially read it, I, I read it to be a, a endorsement of option two, um, which was to include, uh, require one care to include contract language with hospitals, um, stating that all funds received from one care for primary care investment would be, you know, used for those purposes. Um, before we hopped on today, I did notice there was a slight difference in what one care presented and I do apologize for missing that initially but um what one care uh I, I believe was explaining in its written comment was that um it would also be comfortable with the idea of contract language um requiring hospitals to state how they will use uh these funds uh for the the next year um and so this isn't a huge difference uh uh right the first the the option I have written here is is really just a hospital stating that it will do um, what it is required to do with the money um, or what's intended to be done with the money. Um, I do kind of like what OneCare uh, put forth, though, in that um, if if hospitals are giving OneCare some brief explanation of how they're planning on using the money, um, I suppose the advantage there is that the board would um, have the uh, ability to sort of see and see through the contracts between one care and hospitals what the intended use of the money would be um other nice thing is the hospital would get a a bit of a heads up to start thinking about earmarking funds and um uh identifying how it how it was earmarking funds um so just to say i i think that the if i'm understanding one care's position right it, it's it's advocating for option two um, rather than the first option, which would be that one care and hospitals work together to devise a method of tracking these payments. Um, so, so that's that's it for for item one. And then for for the second motion, the only thing I wanted to draw attention to was um, the the idea here again is that one care will be budgeting administrative expenses by function for fiscal year twenty five. 
this motion language is really about what one care is doing for the rest of fiscal year 24. Um, I believe I heard one care explain last week some reservation that gathering uh, data for fiscal year 24 would be incomplete because one cares projects change over the course of the year and um, it might be putting a lot of money toward certain items between July and September that are different than items that we're putting forth for, for other years. So if, if I heard one care correctly, I think there was some question about what the board gains from from having uh, July through September data for, for FY24. Um, but otherwise, the motion language here just points to the FY25 guidance as uh, Michelle just presented it. So what we're really talking about with the second motion is um, uh, whether the board wishes to require one care to start pulling some actuals for uh, fiscal year 24 so that the board can get uh, something like a quarter of data uh, from one care for fiscal year 24 when it uh, submits its FY25 budget in October. Um, so that's just a quick overview of where we're at with both of these. Um, Chair Foster, I'll turn it back to you, but I'm obviously happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Any board member comment or question? I had a, a quick a quick comment or a question. Uh, the first is a question. The second is a comment. Sorry. Um, I I guess Mark, I had read one cares letter differently than you did. I thought that the suggestion about the how related to the hospital budget process. Um, so maybe that's something we could ask one care to clarify chair foster because when i read their comment i think it said this that uh they'd be supportive of us asking hospitals to provide the color commentary about what they're actually doing as well as get the dollars uh, i but see maybe I misinterpreted. well it's worth clarifying um mr boris are you or any of you available to speak to that question Sure thing, happy to. Thanks for the opportunity. Did we all lose him or? Seems like we did. Me. Okay. I think we did. <laughs> Let's just give him a chance to come back. Tom, we lost him. Am I back? Now. Yes. You're back. Thanks. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, at the last meeting, I, I said that I think the story here is really important and the, and the hospitals will be able to tell it better than uh, we can exactly what they're doing in the organizations and how they're evolving care delivery. So I think that is a, a good thing and recommend something in the hospital process. And then, you know, if the motion were to go forward today, I do think option two um, is, is preferred and that we can put something in our contract that makes it clear that the hospitals are expected to be able to um, demonstrate this. I think that's that's reasonable. So I would I would kind of say option two is closer to our intent, but having that opportunity for the hospitals to be to speak for themselves is, a, is an important component. Th thank you. Would a compromise language be um, that the hospital shall demonstrate the use of all funds received from one care for primary care. So instead of just shall use, but shall demonstrate the use of all funds. Is that a question for me? I'm actually posing it to, to anybody on the board, but if you want to answer it, that's, I'll leave that to Chair Foster. <laughs> I wouldn't mind hearing, Mr. Boris, if you have thoughts on that, I wouldn't mind hearing. I think that's reasonable as well. Um, it gives the hospital some flexibility to, to you know, demonstrate, show the way they're using those funds, how they're directing them within their organization. So I, I think that's fine. I don't have any immediate objection to that in the language. And I, I would agree with that change. I mean, the idea here is that 
one this is a one care program and one care is providing the money back to the hospitals for this purpose and one care would have a good sense of how they want to see the money being utilized and how it's being utilized well and so having them report it to one care would be beneficial for one care's ability to impact that right so I, I would agree with that change and support it and on the other two motions i have no other comment other than i support them I would support um, option two with that change. Uh, I also think we can follow up in the hospital budget process as, you know, particularly if they're already um, made aware that they have to demonstrate the use of those funds, we can ask about it in the hospital budget process as well. Um, I had a question about motion two. Um, given the change that we just made in the guidance, looking at expenses, non-salary operating expenses, quote unquote, fixed costs versus the variable costs, the salary costs associated with the programs. I'm just wondering, given that change, uh, what would be possible from one care's perspective, um, if one care you're willing to answer and Chair Foster is willing to <laughs> entertain that answer uh, from July 1st to September, given the change that we've made, it's not so much time tracking as much as it is salary allocation. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I sort of thought of this timing issue that um, OneCare raised as something that can be noted when we get the information, but would be beneficial to at least starting the process and working through the process to see where there's issues or to make it better for 25. Um, but Mr. Boris or Mr. Berman, if you have thoughts on uh, Member Holmes's question. Sure. Uh, thank you for the question. I think it's a good one. So in thinking about this one further as well, um, you know, we're, we're still going to, have to figure out a process at one care to, to segment all the salary expenses into those different categories. And we do have some, you know, timing issues, seasonality issues to work through, but I, I believe we can solve that. The reality though, is that we're essentially going to have one source data uh, set to be used, whether we apply that breakdown to 2024's budget or 2025's budget. So in other words, it's not like we're going to have multiple time studies to compare the evolution. So my my ask is that in light of the fact that this is now part of the 2025 budget process that we can put our, our focus there, we will entertain some sort of a you know time tracking exercise to comply with the table in the 2025 guidance. Um, but personally, I don't think there's a lot of value in taking that and then retrospectively applying it to 2024's budget. Any other board member comment or question? I'll turn to the healthcare advocate. Good afternoon. I we think that member Holmes uh, position makes sense and we can support the motions. Thank you. And I'll open up to public comment on this topic in both motions. Walter, hey, how are you? Hey, Owen, how's it going? Uh, just a, I'm good. A you always give me such a hearty, you always give me such a hearty hello, and I always appreciate it. Hey, why not, right? My weekly <laughs> fix to the care board, right? <laughs> the Owen smile. <laughs> um, a question is, I, I also back these amendments, but is the board going to be watching how these health payments are tracked through one care hospitals and so on? Because if you have just one care doing it, it's kind of like the fox watching that proverbial hen house. Um, well, I, I, I don't mind addressing that, Walter. So, I, you know, I think one care has an incentive to watch the hen house, if you will, and that they want these programs to work as effectively as possible and to have the population health data come out really well, right? And they've put a pretty strong effort into focusing on particular areas. So I, I would, I would. Be confident that they would watch watch that and care very much. 
Um, and then second, I think this is the point one care made, and, and I think it's a good point, which is it's also incumbent on the board in the hospital budget process to track and ensure that these funds are being used well. So I think that would be the intent. I don't think we got as far as we wanted to last year in our hospital process in doing that. These hospital budgets are really quite intense and complex, and sometimes some things don't get brought to the top, um, but that doesn't mean they're not important or they won't be in the future. Do you have anything else, Walter? Oh, no, just kind of, I'm just, you know, curious if the board's going to be watching it as well. Yes, I think I think we will take a look at that the best we can in the hospital budget process. Um, Mr. Berman. Thank you, Abe Berman, CEO on Care Vermont. I uh, just want to thank the board and the staff for all the work on this and for um, what I thought was a really constructive process of going through the guidance um, and just want to go on record. I think for me um, and for the rest of OneCare, we think that um, motion one, option two with the modified language coming from member homes makes makes sense. Um, for motion two, we feel like what was just covered in the 25 um, budget guidance process would, would get us there. And, and again, we're trying to minimize the amount of effort we have on individual tracking elements while still getting the information the board needs to make good decisions. So just wanted to go on record with motion one, option two makes sense to us. Motion two, um, I would say pass on in favor of um, the work we just discussed with the 25 budget guidance. Thank you. Any other public comment? I have another thought when ap after we've determined there's no more public comment or whenever you're ready, Chair Foster. I don't see anyone else, so you go ahead. Great, thanks. Um, what? So I think, like in my mind, part of the impetus towards trying to get information on fiscal year 24 was um, to ensure that the work is happening towards 25. I know there was frustration from some folks about um, not getting the data earlier. So I'm wondering if a middle ground could be, um, instead of trying to shoehorn like a quarter of data, which won't be reflective of the seasonality and thus won't really be very comparable to 25, um, could be a check-in or some sort of reporting about how the timekeeping setup or whatever it is you need to do um, is going at some point between now and um, when the budget is submitted. So I'll just throw that out as a suggestion um, because I don't really think that fiscal year 24 one quarter will be very comparable to what we get in 25. So I'm not sure how useful it would be to me personally, I'm, although I'm open to hear you know, others disagree. Uh, you know, I like that suggestion, Robin. And one of the things that I was thinking was we could, del maybe the motion could be we delegate to staff to work with one care um, to ensure that the you know that the, that what they're going to be doing to comply with the fiscal year 25 budget by function guidance is what in fact we want and having some you know intermediary report a, a check in with us at some point between now and when that budget is submitted that in fact complies with it and it's the, the process makes sense um, for us so I think I like Robin your suggestion rather than inventing an entire wheel, not having it be comp comparable and maybe um, not satisfying the board's need to understand the budget by function. So I think working instead towards fiscal year 25, making sure that what they're collecting is what in fact we want, um, and then hitting the ground running with fiscal year 25 makes sense to me. I, I like the idea of a um, kind of a check-in approach and making sure that it is uh, what we expect and need. Um, but I, I do want to point out that um, 
the argument's been made that the vast majority of expenditures are fixed and therefore one quarter should reflect the year. That if costs were more variable, we might see seasonality, but if they are indeed as fixed as they've been, um, as has been suggested, a quarter would be helpful. And I, I would prefer to still see that data, even if the main point is to make sure that the tables, the data, the information is in the manner that we'd like it to be. Maybe I'm misremembering Tom, but I thought that um, last week there was a one example that stuck with me, I thought, <laughs> but I could be misremembering, uh, was <laughs> that the contracting was completed for fiscal year 24. So while contracting itself may be a mm. fixed cost, it may mm. be 100% accrued in the spring. Over. And so the quarter that mm. we it would be zero, even because it's yeah. completed. Now, again, maybe I'm misremembering that, but that's what had made me think it might not be useful. Yeah, well, even if you are misremembering, it's a great point. There could be some, there could be something else. And so you know, that, that makes really good sense. And I hadn't thought of that just now. Um, I, I think given the difficulty we've, we've had um, getting to this point, I would like to see some information, even if, it's we're considering a, a trial purpose or or test period um, that just continuing to go back and forth about the terms and the layout without really being sure that the the tables can be filled in. Um, I think um, I, I wouldn't be happy with with that. But that's a that's a great point, Robin, and I had not thought of it. And thank you for bringing it up. Yeah, and I don't disagree about you know wanting to try and work through some of the kinks now, so that we're not trying to then do that again in fiscal year twenty five. So I think the spirit is aligned. I agree. I'm okay with um, dropping motion two um, with the caveat that to me, part of this is understanding expenses that may or may not need to be there. And ultimately, as we all understand, it's one care's burden to satisfy their budget. And if they can't do it this way and they have some other way, that's fine. But the intent at least for me was to really try and give close regulatory scrutiny to the, to the costs to make sure that they're actually beneficial and to have a mechanism to do that. So whether it's through this process or just through the regular budget submission and review, I'm okay doing it. Um, but I, I will be looking pretty closely at what the expenses are and whether or not they're they're pulling through in a beneficial way. And I thought this would be a good way to try and identify that. So that being said, it's okay with me if we drop motion too. Okay, great. Um, I think we have one motion that sounds like it will be um, necessary. So I will move that the board amend the One Care Vermont fiscal year 24 budget order by ordering One Care to prospectively include in its contract with hospital providers contract language stating, sorry, contract language demonstrating how the hospital uses all funds received from One Care for primary care investment to enhance primary care initiatives, which otherwise would not be funded to the same extent. Second. Any other board member discussion on that motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 And the motion carries unanimously. And we will 
skip motion two on the discussion that we had today. Um, thank you very much, Ms. Sawyer, for the presentation and Mr. Hengsler. It's really well done as always. And thank you, One Care, for attending and providing your feedback today. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, that's all we have on the agenda. Um, is there any other old business or new business for the board? And I will move to adjourn. Second. All in favor, all in favor say aye. 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 We are adjourned. Everyone have a nice afternoon. Thank you.